This is the Soviet Death Star. It's a space station equipped with a powerful laser cannon that was designed for war in Earth orbit. Now, putting weapons in space might be a hot topic today, but the idea is nothing new. This all played out before in the 1980s, and that means we have a good opportunity here to learn something from our own past. Let's talk about Star Wars. No, not that Star Wars. The real-life Star Wars was a space-based missile defense system that was championed by US President Ronald Reagan. The idea was that the Americans would place a network of interceptor satellites into orbit around the Earth. These space weapons would have the ability to detect ballistic missile launches from the surface and destroy them on their way up. This would essentially render the Soviet nuclear weapons arsenal useless. That was a pretty bold proposition for the time. Throughout the 1970s, relations between the US and Soviet Union had actually been getting a lot better. We went from the Cuban Missile Crisis of the 1960s that nearly annihilated civilization as we know it, to a period of apparent diplomacy and cooperation. Although, looks can be deceiving, so keep that in mind as we work our way through this web of political lies. For example, there was probably no better symbol of Cold War unity between the East and West than the Apollo-Soyuz mission of 1975. The entire world watched as an American spacecraft and a Soviet spacecraft met up in orbit and docked together. What followed was two days of the first ever international hangout in space. The crews worked on scientific experiments together, they exchanged gifts, shared meals, and even listened to each other's music. On the surface, it looked like everyone was getting along great. Meanwhile, what the world didn't know was that just one year prior, in 1974, the Soviets had actually launched a secret military space station into orbit that was equipped with a machine gun. And not only did they launch the first gun into space, they also fired the first gun in space. Now, this was not any kind of advanced space weapons platform, not yet. All they really did was tear a gun off a military aircraft and bolt it to a small space station. It wasn't even attached to a mechanism that would let you aim the gun. The entire space station had to be pointed in the direction that they wanted to shoot. It was only test fired a couple of times, mostly for fear that the recoil from the gun would tear a hole in the wall of the spacecraft and everyone inside would be killed. Anyway, all of this militarization of space wouldn't stay secret for very long. In 1980, Ronald Reagan was elected as the 40th president of the United States. And once he took power, Reagan didn't waste much time making big changes. We typically refer to this period as Reaganomics. The president cut government spending, cut taxes, cut regulations on private industries, and opened up free trade. For the most part, Reagan was a small government kind of guy. But one area where he did favor a hard-nosed approach was with the US military and the ongoing Cold War with the Soviet Union. You know how much sound shapes the feeling of space. The right music can make a distant planet feel alive or turn a quiet orbit into something emotional. For an upcoming video, we are building a full 3D sequence, something cinematic that shows you space in a way cameras can't. And I've been using a tool called Suno to create all the music for it. Suno is an AI music creation tool that lets anyone make original songs in minutes, but what's special about it is how it empowers your creativity instead of replacing it. I've been using it to experiment with tones, textures, and pacing for this sequence. I started with a simple prompt, orchestral sci-fi score with ambient synths and a sense of discovery. Within seconds, Suno gave me a few variations that actually sounded good, not AI-generated good, but emotionally real. From there, I could isolate stems, remix sections, and shape the score around the timing of the visuals. It's like having a studio at your fingertips without losing any of the creative control. If you make videos, podcasts, or just love experimenting with sound, Suno makes it possible to create something professional without needing years of music training. And since you get full commercial rights to everything you make, you can actually use your tracks anywhere, even in monetized projects like this one. I've genuinely had a blast using it, and it's wild how quickly it's become part of my workflow. So if you've ever wanted to make your own soundtrack for a video, a game, or just for fun, check out Suno at Suno.com. And when that 3D sequence premieres, every note you hear in it will be music we created ourselves using Suno.
Instead of trying to mitigate the threats of a nuclear conflict with diplomacy and cooperation, Reagan chose a giant network of weapons satellites. Technically, this was known as the Strategic Defense Initiative, but most people remember it as Star Wars, mostly because at the time, it sounded more like science fiction than a real-life military operation. But the fundamental idea behind Star Wars was nothing to joke about. If the United States actually had a successful space-based anti-missile system that would essentially remove the long-standing barrier of mutually assured destruction from the nuclear war equation. For decades, the biggest deterrent to actually using a nuclear weapon against an enemy was the knowledge that as soon as you launch a strike to annihilate them, they are going to launch their own missiles that will annihilate you. All-out war became a no-win scenario. But if the US has this global defense system, it would grant them free reign to destroy anything they want with no threat of meaningful retaliation. The Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev did not like that idea very much, so he spent a lot of his time on the international stage trying to convince Mr. Reagan that there was no need to go through with this whole Star Wars thing because the Soviet Union wasn't actually interested in nuking anyone. Everybody should just chill. Meanwhile, behind the scenes of all this, Gorbachev's engineers had already begun work on a Death Star. And in fairness to Gorbachev, this is a project that had been in the works long before he took control of the Soviet Union. You see, the Americans had been way overselling this whole Star Wars thing. They didn't really have the technology to make an orbital defense network, and even if they did, the cost of it all would have been unsustainable. The problem was that the Soviets had way overbought what the US was selling, so they drew up a response that was equally as extreme. Now, they didn't actually call their project the Death Star, they called it Skiff, which is named after an ancient warrior tribe from Central Asia known as the Scythians, which many interpret to mean barbarian. The idea was that if America had satellites that could destroy their missiles, then the Soviets would build an orbital battle station that could destroy those satellites. And to accomplish this, it would use a giant laser cannon. So you can see where the Death Star references come from. But designing a laser that would work in space on an orbital platform was no easy task. And we don't know exactly how the Soviet weapon was built, but we do know that they used a CO2-based laser. Here's a simplified look at how that works. First, you pump carbon dioxide gas into a big tube. Then you energize that gas by shocking it with a massive amount of electricity which will cause the CO2 molecules to start emitting light. Then you bounce that light back and forth between the two mirrors to intensify it into a beam. After you've built up enough energy, you release the beam from the tube where it passes through a lens that will concentrate the light like a magnifying glass. And that's your laser. So the more electricity you pump in there, the stronger your beam of light will become. And the laser that the Soviets built for their skiff was said to use one megawatt of power, which is enough to supply about 500 American houses. It was a big laser, and that meant that the battle station constructed around it had to be equally as massive. The skiff would be 40 meters in length, 4 meters in diameter, and weigh in at 95 metric tons, making it longer and heavier than the Space Shuttle Orbiter. It would be one of the largest objects ever put into space. So to accomplish that, the Soviets would need an incredibly powerful rocket booster to actually get their giant laser battle station into orbit. This is where Energia comes in. On the surface, the Energia rocket booster was designed to launch the Buran shuttle. Yes, the Soviets had a very short-lived copy of the space shuttle, and that's a whole other video. But aside from that one job, Energia could function as a standalone rocket and lift over 100 metric tons of payload to low Earth orbit. Now, in theory, the Soviets have their Death Star, and they have their giant rocket booster, and they are ready to assert their military dominance over outer space. But that's the thing with so many of these Cold War space ideas. They sound great as propaganda, and they probably even looked great on paper, until reality sets in. Just like the American Star Wars satellite network, Skiff was a really bad idea, and Gorbachev knew it. He was well aware of how provocative it would be to launch a giant space laser into orbit. He knew that the Americans weren't actually going to deploy their constellation of military satellites. And he also knew that the Soviet Union was rapidly going broke, almost entirely because of ridiculous overspending 
on insane military projects, like a Death Star. But they'd already built the Skiff and the Energia, and what little money the Soviets had left was already wasted on this whole project. So they decided to just go ahead and do it anyway. Only the more the Soviets worked, the more they realized that their ambitions had far exceeded their abilities, and the one megawatt laser cannon was just too big and complex to get working in any reasonable time frame. So they renamed the spacecraft to Skiff D, and they settled for a much smaller CO2 laser cannon, one that the Soviet military had already been testing on large jet airplanes. But even that started to become a bridge too far for Gorbachev. He was not nearly as interested in military bravado as many of his predecessors. His government brought a new direction to the Soviet Union known as perestroika, or restructuring. It was essentially about standing down from the Cold War. You probably know this man's name best from the famous Ronald Reagan quote. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And that's what he did. The Berlin Wall went down, and that marked the beginning of the end for the Soviet Union. So it's really no surprise that under his watch, the Soviet Death Star went from having a giant laser to a medium laser to eventually no laser at all. The disarmed spacecraft was renamed to Skiff DM, and in fairness, they weren't entirely neutering the battle station. It still had the targeting system for the laser that was going to be tested in orbit using inflatable balloons as stand-ins for American satellites. So they still wanted to prove that they could laser something in space if they really wanted to. As a further cover for the military nature of the skiff, the Soviet technicians painted the name Mir-2 on the side, theoretically to convince American spies that this was just another harmless space station. But ultimately, the spacecraft was renamed to Polyus, which means polar. And given their location, it's safe to assume that the Soviets meant North Pole, so from Barbarian to Santa Claus. Nothing to see here. The only weird thing is that because Polyus is so long, it actually has to be attached to the booster upside down in order to keep the power and propulsion module as far away from the booster's rocket engines as possible. But in space, there really is no up and down, so it shouldn't matter either way. At least, that's what they assumed. And in the spring of 1987, the Energia rocket booster carrying the Polyus spacecraft roared to life in a midnight launch from the desert of Kazakhstan. For the first test of such an incredibly powerful rocket, everything actually went shockingly well. Energia came off the launch pad at a little bit of a tilt, but it straightened out and powered its way through the atmosphere. At seven minutes into the flight, Polyus is ready to separate from the Energia core. All that the spacecraft has to do is drift away from its booster, flip itself 180 degrees to get right side up again, and then ignite its engines to reach orbital velocity. And that's pretty much what the spacecraft did, except for one minor complication. In their haste to get the Polyus ready for launch, the Soviets had made a logical decision to just reuse an existing guidance computer from their Soyuz capsule. All they really needed to do was get into low Earth orbit. That's already what the Soyuz computer was programmed to do. So easy solution, except the Soyuz was never designed to launch upside down. So as soon as the Polyus flipped itself 180 degrees, the guidance computer freaked out and flipped it back another 180 degrees. And then the main engines ignited. So all of the thrust that was supposed to lift the spacecraft into orbit was now being directed straight back down towards the surface of the Earth. And that was the final journey of the Soviet Death Star. Just 10 minutes after launch, the giant spacecraft impacted the atmosphere at incredible speed and broke up into hundreds of pieces of flaming debris that rained down over the Pacific Ocean. A strange end for a strange idea in a strange time. And now, four decades later, it's all happening again. Only this time, we might actually have the technology to pull it off. Donald Trump wants to build his own Star Wars, the Golden Dome, and somewhere in the world, someone is building their response. What will it be this time?